Good morning, and welcome to worship this morning. We're so delighted that you are joining with us this morning in our worship service. It's exciting that it's Christmas time, season of Advent, a season of preparation for the Christ child to be born in our midst. Uh, we're very excited about this. Um, I know that amidst the uh, COVID outbreak, it's hard to get excited about a lot of things, but let's get excited about Christmas coming and uh, about what that means in our lives. So it's actually the second week in Advent. I know that the announcement says the first week, but it's actually the second week in Advent. Um, if you came by the church or had delivered to you so far um, one of the Advent kits, you will have found in your Advent kit a little sprig of evergreen. So if you want to make that into a circle around the little votive candle that was in your kit, then you will have um, that available when we light the Advent wreath together, or light the Advent candle in the Advent wreath. And so um, if you want to set that up and make sure that that's ready to go. Also, it is Communion Sunday. Uh, it's the first Sunday of the month. And so if you want to make sure that you have your communion elements, whatever you have decided to use for the bread and the cup, um, just if you'll have that ready, then we will be able to do that a little bit later on in the service. I want to continue to express our gratitude to you for remembering the church with your financial contributions during this time of this pandemic. Um, it's such a blessing to be serving this church and to be a part of people who really show the dedication that they have to the church uh, th through giving. Uh, you know, we're we're able to meet our financial uh, obligations. We're going to still be here when the doors open up because of you. We, of course, still don't know when that will be, as if you're watching the news, and uh, Dr. Fauci and all of those folks who are guiding us through this pandemic, you know, we'll probably be well into the new year before we're able to open back up, but we will be able to open back up because of you. And because of your generosity, your church will still be here. So we do want to express our thanks to you and ask you to please remember to send in your contributions and uh, help us to keep the church functioning during this time. Today is the first Sunday of the month, and that means that it's birthday Sunday. And so for all of you with December birthdays, this is for you. Hit it, Judy. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. Woohoo! All right, that sounds great. Well, our first hymn is, O oh, Come All Ye Faithful. Um, like I told you, normally we were going to have some YouTube music for this. Uh, I'm having trouble getting a signal for the internet here in the sanctuary, so I'll get our IT guys to help me make sure that that's good during the week and that we're good to go for next week. But for this week, we're going to have Judy uh, playing the hymns and displaying the words as we go. So we're going to start off with, O Come All Ye Faithful. It is in your hymnal, the United Methodist hymnal, on page 234, if you have that handy. And let us join together in singing. Thank you. 
for putting up with me and my singing. Um, hey, we were supposed to have YouTube leading you, so thank you for your forgiveness. And you, you can, it's okay to laugh now, that's all, it's all good. Um, would ask that you would join with me in the, the call to celebration. The day of God is coming. Lift up your voices. We await God's coming day with anticipation. Praise the one who grants us the gift of life. We give thanks for God's continuing faithfulness. On this second Sunday of Advent, we light the love candle as a symbol of the hope and anticipation of the birth of the Christ child. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Today we remember that God gave us his only son to live among us as a human, suffering as we do, and he loved us so much that he sacrificed his son so that we all may have eternal life. Today, we thank you for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. We who have sat in darkness have seen a great light, the light of Jesus Christ, our salvation. On this second Sunday in Advent, we light the love candle as a symbol of God's love that he sent his Son to be among us, and to die for our salvation. Let us pray together. O oh God, rejoicing, we remember the promise of your Son as a light from this candle. May the blessing of Christ come upon us, brightening our way and guiding us by his truth. May Christ, our Savior, bring life into the darkness of our world and to us as we wait for his coming. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I will pan the camera back to uh, show us lighting the candle. If you want to get your candles ready to be lit, we will light our candles together. Last week, we lit the candle that stood for hope because Christ is the hope in our lives. This week, we light the candle for love. Jesus Christ brings love into the world and shows us the way to love one another.
Will you join with me in our community prayer? Loving God, we rejoice in this season of anticipation as we remember your promises and look forward to ways that you reveal yourself to us. May your presence be real to us in this hour. Strengthen us for the victories over temptation, for renewal of our love for you and one another, for leadership and service among your people. We give thanks that you have called us into community and commissioned us to make a difference in the world. Equip us today for the tasks you set before us. Amen. Today, as we go to a time of prayer, I would ask that you remember all of those folks who are touched in some way or another by the effects of COVID, whether they have had it themselves or have it currently, whether they have had a loved one or someone that they know who has struggled with it, we would ask that you continue to hold them in prayer. Let us also hold in prayer those who are struggling and working so hard to bring us vaccinations and to make it so that some, at some point, we will be able to worship together again personally and uh, in our church together. So if we continue to pray for these things, I would uh, ask you at this time of year to have hope and to exercise that hope as you pray and to have love and to love one another and care for one another during this time. Let us take a moment now and silently pray. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise for all you have done for your people. We thank you that you revealed yourself in your son and that you've made a way that we can come into new life, that we can constantly be reshaped into your image and your likeness. We thank you for all the blessings of life, for family and health, peace, for provision and shelter and friendship. We thank you that you have taken our hands and are walking the journey with us in the midst of the COVID pandemic. As we continue in the season of Advent, we thank you also for what you have planned that we cannot know. We thank you for the unexpected and thank you for all that you've planned which is beyond our comprehension. Oh, give us a spirit of holy expectation, a capacity to live our lives with wide-eyed wonder for the surprises you have in store for us. You shocked the world, turned it upside down when you took flesh in Jesus and made a new covenant when you visited the world as one of us and the God who created all things became a part of creation. So shock us again. Visit us in surprising and unexpected ways. Give us a yearning for your visitation and an eagerness to see what you will do in us. Let your work of salvation in us be fresh. Renew your calling upon our lives and use us in ways we never imagined. Give new life to all our relationships. Visit us again and do what only you can imagine. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Amen.
This is a time when we are giving thanks for all of the gifts that you all are sending through the mail and putting through the mail slot in the exterior of the building. We're so grateful that you are remembering your church. I, I know I've said that before, but it humbles my heart to see these gifts coming in and to know that they're from you and that they have love attached to them. Thank you. And so we would dedicate all of those to our Lord and to the ministry that you have provided that God can do through this church. So let us pray together now. While we are waiting and preparing for Christ to appear, we are seeking, O oh God, to act as faithful followers. May our offerings help to extend the promise of salvation to people whose lives are broken. May these gifts offer love and compassion to all God's children. Amen. Our hymn is number 242, Love Came Down at Christmas. share with you our scripture passage for today. It comes from the ninth chapter of Isaiah, and it includes verse 1 and then skips to verse 6 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I am not wearing my mask today because there's only two of us in the sanctuary and we're at least 25 feet apart. So Judy and I are keeping each other safe.
What do you suppose God looks like? We have no shortage of images of God. In fact, the Christian faith has inspired more artwork than any other movement in history. We have sculptures, paintings, mosaics, even music that seeks to depict the divine. And none, of course, in quite the same way. I suspect that if someone were to ask us today what God looks like to us, we would say one thing. And then, you know, we would later on answer it in a different way. We don't know. And sometimes our opinion changes from year to year, month to month, even day to day. The truth of the matter is, God is so big that it's nearly impossible to pin him down in a few words, or even a few brush strokes on canvas or notes on a score. So it should come as no surprise then that centuries before his birth, expectations of a coming Messiah were quite diverse. They were even contradictory. In that world of exile and oppression, many of the Israelites expected a worldly political revolutionary who would restore the glory days of the divinic kingdom with its peace and with its prosperity. Other people looked for a Messiah who would represent the Greek ideal, focusing entirely on the afterlife. And still others felt that it was blasphemous to even speak about what the Messiah might be like. So it was into that atmosphere that the prophet Isaiah lifted up a vision of a miracle that was to come in our midst. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace. So what is your picture of God? Many years ago there was a great emperor who decided that he must have the finest clothes. So he called on two weavers in his kingdom to fashion a new suit for him, and he promised them a fine payment. So in return, the weavers promised to deliver a suit made of the most elegant fabrics. So fantastic was this material, in fact, that it would be invisible to anyone who is unfit for this position. So the emperor is ecstatic when the weavers return a few days later with his new clothes. So he's excited, and he decides not to admit that he can't see them for fear of appearing unfit for his position. So as he dresses in his new clothes, his ministers, who are also unable to see them, extol their great beauty. Oh, so beautiful. Well, once dressed, the emperor processes before his subjects. Now, they play along like the ministers did, remarking about the wonderful craftsmanship of the emperor's new clothes. Does the emperor have on new clothes? Well, nearly everybody seems to think so. And the few who do not cast down their eyes and just pretend to, to agree and eventually, over time, the crowd sets a new standard, and even the dissenters must agree that the perception of the group is the only one that really matters. 
Those who clearly see that the emperor has no clothes on must agree that he has new clothes. And they must either keep their mouth shut or look odd in a culture that has settled the matter in their own minds. Everybody was playing along. And so it is, I think, that that happens with our perception of God, especially here around Christmas time. We have this most odd mixture of elves and apostles, of reindeer and shepherds, of snowmen and magi, of Jesus and Santa. And generally speaking, it's the non-Christian elements that seem to prevail in the mix. A Christmas miracle is directly tied to the number of gifts that we find under the tree. Christians celebrate the birth of Christ, but it ends up looking more like the celebration of Santa Claus. Jesus, a golden calf messiah, who promises to fulfill all earthly wants and wishes, an idol who supports our quest for material wealth outside the relationship with God. This is who we're looking at. Now think about the way that we describe Santa. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. And he knows if you've been bad or good. Such descriptions of Santa reflect the way that we have reduced God to some kind of mystical watchdog who judges our niceness or our naughtiness and then rewards or punishes us accordingly. But here's the thing. This is not the God we see in Jesus. Jesus didn't come shimmying down some chimney bearing gifts for good boys and girls. In fact, Jesus was not the Messiah most people were expecting and hoping for at all. Everything about Jesus' life stood in stark contrast to worldly values. Jesus arrived on the scene not in great strength, but vulnerable and weak. He was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth, but in a cave for animals. Jesus was a Palestinian Jew who grew up in a community of marginalized and oppressed people. As a matter of fact, Jesus spent the earliest years of his life as a refugee running from political genocide. And growing up, he lived in a little village as a member of a working class family. And then when Jesus got older, he insisted that the world's obsessions with wealth and with power it be instead identified, he, he identified with the weak. He, he identified with the powerless. He identified with widows and orphans and tax collectors and prostitutes and lepers. He didn't condemn sinners, but he defended, he forgave, he healed, and he saved them. So what does God look like? God looks like Jesus. He is Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And that, of course, is exactly what Christmas is all about. Christmas is a celebration of a miracle, the greatest miracle that there ever was. But somehow, we've managed to edge the miracle worker out of his own birthday. 
Now it's time to reclaim the right celebration of Christmas, to speak out against those pervasive cultural forces, to name things as they really are. It's time to take Christmas back by planning new traditions and those things that focus on Jesus' presence rather than the often forgettable presence that we expect to receive. Now, I'm not a Scrooge, but the magical American commercialized Christmas experience is unattainable. There's no miracle in it. In the midst of trying to attain it anyway, we miss the miraculous birth of our Savior, wonderful Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The dictionary defines a miracle as a visible interruption of the laws of nature, understood only by divine intervention and often accompanied by a miracle worker. In other words, the miracle is a unique event. This a unique event in the world that God does through ordinary people, and he does it through people like you and me. We are, you are God's miracle worker. You are God's means to affect change in the world. And if Christmas is to be celebrated as it should be, as it should, and it begins with us making ourselves available to God so that God's work might be done in the world. Just as he did with Mary so many years ago, God wants to birth a miracle through you and me this Christmas. There wasn't anything extraordinary about Mary. And I think most of us can relate to not being extraordinary. Most of us would describe ourselves as ordinary. From the time we're small children, we become cruelly boxed into a, a particular pecking order of who's cool, who's smart, who's beautiful, and who's not. But look at the biblical story leading up to Jesus' birth. Throughout Scripture, God chose ordinary, seemingly unqualified people through whom to do miracles. Remember stuttering Moses? Then there was the youngest child, David. There was barren Elizabeth. And of course, Mary. Mary came from a very common family. She wasn't married. She didn't have a formal education. She wasn't a religious leader. And yet God called on her. Now what does that say about God's choices? What does it say about God's perspective on what it means to be a beautiful and influential person? Any of us can be miracle workers. And the time for us to start is now. No more pretending that somehow trees piled high with presents can make Christmas what it should be. The power of Emmanuel is the power to create change in the world through God's action in your life. But the problem of the world is that we're constantly looking for the extraordinary when God uses the ordinary. The majority of us are ordinary people. Now we must be willing to open ourselves up to God's work in our lives. But such vulnerability doesn't come easy Grace may be free, 
but it's never cheap. Miracles come at a cost. At Christmas, we celebrate the birth of the Messiah, who was born not only to die sacrificially for us, but also to show us how to live sacrificially. Now that's not a very pleasant thought for most of us. So it's really not surprising that when all of this is said and done, most folks would rather have a holly jolly Christmas than to give of themselves as a womb for the miracle of God. The message of Christmas is about a sacrificial gift, but the joy comes through giving of ourselves, for God's kingdom cannot be compared. Are you ready for God to birth a Christmas miracle through you? Just think about the miracle that God can work through us if we adhere to God's call in our lives. The Bible clearly teaches us that in order for our lives to be meaningful, we need to give them away. Meaning is not found in personal comfort. Meaning is not found in material luxuries. So it should be no surprise that the meaningful Christmas is not found in mindless spending and eating and stress. Christmas is only truly Christmas when we open ourselves to God's presence in our lives, when we continue that miraculous work begun by Jesus so long ago. We find meaning when we give sacrificially to those in need. We find meaning when we tell of the wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal Father, Prince of Peace. We have to tell of that to those who live in darkness and despair. And when we can do that, we are giving to Jesus himself the very best gift of all. Amen. We are about to observe the sacrament of Holy Communion. I would invite you at this time to take those elements that you have at home, the bread and the cup, those things that you're using for the bread and cup, and partake of these elements with me. Jesus, with his disciples took bread and he broke it and then he gave it to them and he said this is my body given for you for the forgiveness of your sins as often as you eat this I want you to think of me and I want you to eat this because this is my body it was broken for you you have sinned and now this is for the forgiveness of those sins. And then he took the cup 
and he gave it to his disciples. He gave thanks to God for the cup and for the bread. And then the disciples shared in that meal with him. He said, it is my blood. It is poured out for you so that you might have eternal life. My friends, today as we take this bread, we eat that. I would invite you to eat yours at this time. And then he took the cup. And he gave it to them and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. I would invite you as you go through Advent to, from time to time, just take a piece of bread while you're eating, stop and remember and give thanks to God for this act of grace, for this forgiveness of what you have done and that brings you closer to God. I would ask you to as you're drinking something, to give thanks to God for this and for the fact that you have eternal life because of Jesus. May God bless you all and may you accept for yourself that gift of salvation, that gift of eternal life. He's offering it. Will you take it? Will you be Christ-like? Amen. I would invite you to join with me in singing There's a Song in the Air, number 249 in your hymnals. Baby's low cry 
was high. <coughs> now you know why I don't sing solos. <coughs> and if you will please join with me in the benediction. Prepare the way for Christ's witness to be heard. Christ brings hope for true peace to all people. God's word brings forth comfort and challenge. We rejoice that we can be servants in Christ's name. Amen.